What Medicaid expansion allows us to do is to reclaim $13 billion of our money. There's no federal dollars. There are dollars that we send to Washington. Reclaim it and, um, and help people who are disabled, mentally ill, addicted, and help them to get a life back too. And it will keep Arizona's tax dollars here at home, rather than allowing them to go to Washington to be spent on who knows what. Now let me be clear. Refusing these federal dollars would not mean they wouldn't be spent. It just means that they would be spent to expand health care access in New York or Connecticut or Ohio or somewhere else. In 2013, a majority of South Carolina's legislature voted to leave 11 billion of our tax dollars in Washington instead of bringing them back to the state to pay for health care for low-income workers. The money is available to all states to expand their Medicaid programs to cover adults living at 138 percent of the federal poverty level. That's about $16,000 a year for an individual and $32,500 for a family of four. Our state's decision leaves more than 200,000 very poor South Carolinians without any options for health coverage. It's a colossal blunder on the part of the state not to go with the Medicaid expansion. Think about who the people are that would be benefiting from the Medicaid expansion. First place, they're taxpayers. They pay sales taxes indirectly or directly. They pay property taxes. They may pay income taxes. These are basically hardworking, low-income people who need this coverage. They can't possibly afford it. I worked hard all my life. So very hard. And you can't afford health care. You can't afford dental care. And uh, I get sick and I'm not needed. And I can't find nobody to help me. You don't have to have lost everything to need help. Um, I'm just an average person. I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm just an average citizen. and. I think sometimes we're forgotten. Just imagine how you would feel if you had a young child or an elderly parent or even a husband or a wife that you could not take care of and you had to sit there with them at home and watch them waste away. Unfortunately, in too many circles, public and private, there's the stereotype that those covered by Medicaid and other forms of assistance are those who are lazy, uh, those who don't try to work or try to help themselves. And that's certainly not the case with my granddaughters and my daughter's situation. She works a full-time job 40 hours a week and uh, just because of financial obligations is not able to purchase private health insurance. Put yourself in other people's positions and have the compassion to understand that uh, we've got to help these people. What I try to communicate to people is, first of all, it could be you. At age 26, John Green was diagnosed with Wegner's a rare autoimmune disease that causes the body to attack its own capillaries. Come here, baby. Much of the next several months are a blur to John, who spent weeks in and out of intensive care. At times, John was in a medically induced coma, breathing with the help of a ventilator. While John was in the hospital, the small company he'd worked for dropped health coverage for its workers. It could no longer afford the cost of the premiums. He was on Medicaid for maybe two months, which helped cover um, all of that initial hospitalization that his um, primary insurance didn't cover. Um, but as soon as he got approved for disability in like July of 2010, um, the Medicaid stopped because they said he made too much money. And his disability check at that time was $858. That was his only income and Medicaid said he made too much money. And that was before he was eligible for Medicare. If I'm sitting there as a small business owner, as I was for many years, 
if Medicaid expansion is not in effect, I'm worried about the cost shifting that's going to happen to me and my employees. As a businessman, Bill Settlemeyer understands the financial pressures on employers who want to provide insurance coverage to their people but see the price tag pushed out of reach as the cost of treating uninsured patients is shifted to those with insurance. I think that the failure to pass the Medicaid expansion is going to have a lot of unforeseen costs for small businesses as well as all businesses. But in particular, hospitals are going to lose over seven years about $3 billion in reimbursements they would have gotten otherwise from the federal government. That means that they're going to have to make up that revenue somewhere else. It's going to be paid by patients. It means it's going to be paid by employers who self-insure or buy insurance coverage, be paid by employees, it's going to be paid by individual insureds. So by walking away from that federal money, the state has made a decision, we're going to pay that out of our own pockets. Much of the research being conducted indicates that Mr. Settlemeyer's concerns are well-founded. Researchers at the RAND Corporation concluded that South Carolina and 13 other states will collectively spend one billion more on uncompensated care in 2016 than they would have if they had expanded their Medicaid programs. And Moody's Investor Services, one of the financial firms that ranks a state's credit worthiness, has warned that states that opt out of the Medicaid expansion but have a relatively high proportion of uninsured residents will be hit the hardest. South Carolina is one of those states. And I think it hurt our economic competitiveness because we're going to be a state where this is an extra expense which raises the cost of business. Researchers at the University of South Carolina Moore School of Business have calculated that bringing an additional $11 billion into South Carolina to expand Medicaid would create 44,000 new jobs, $1.5 billion in new income, and enough tax revenue to more than pay for the cost of expansion over the first seven years. Without the expansion, we are leaving more than 200,000 South Carolinians in the shadows. John was always my healthy child. He was um, almost never sick. For many, many days, it, was, it just looked very hopeless. He fought for his life, and they fought for his life. There's just so much I still wanted to do. You know, I, I, hadn't, I, I mean, I kept thinking a lot of times I would tell my family, it's like, I just want to go to the beach, you know? I don't care how sick I am, I want to go to the beach one more time. So it was a lot of things that I still wanted to do. After four months in the hospital, John went home expecting to resume a normal life. But within 10 days, he was very sick again. The strong drugs used to fight Wegners had destroyed his kidneys. He had to start dialysis. His only hope of escaping the painful procedure he endured three times a week, four hours at a time, was to have a kidney transplant. When he got the diagnosis of end-stage renal disease, he automatically qualified for Medicare. It'd be impossible for anyone to pay for dialysis. I mean, you know, I don't care how much money you make, there's no way you can pay for that. I mean, just dialysis is something like $800,000 a year. When Allison Green was approved to give one of her kidneys to her son, she wondered how they could afford for her to take more time from her job, especially with the medical expenses facing them. John's friend stepped in and raised money for a special fund to help him with his medical bills. The best way to stretch those dollars was to use some of them to purchase Medicare supplemental insurance, which is about $600 a month. But now, you know, 15 months later, that fund is depleted. And, um, and without it, my medications are two to three thousand dollars a month just for the anti-rejection drugs that, you know, if I don't have, I would probably lose the kidney and be back on dialysis. He fully believed that he was going to come back and get a job and get his life back and start, um, you know, just get back into life. For the past year, he's looked for a job. As long as I make enough money to pay for insurance, I'd be fine with that. In the meantime, John needs help with the cost of his medications, and he needs it now. He has reapplied for Medicaid assistance. Any political leaders, legislators, others who really say that our low-income workers don't need health care coverage, drop your own coverage. Drop your coverage for your families, drop your coverage for yourself, because if they don't need it, why do you need it? What's the difference? 
Insurance coverage is a big factor in determining who is likely to get preventative care, which can detect health issues early when they are simpler and less expensive to treat. According to the Harvard School of Public Health, increasing Medicaid coverage to low-income adults would reduce death by improving access to health care. Time and time again, I end up in seeing patients who are at quite an advanced stage of cancer. And I wish they could have been seen early on. Most of the colon cancers, majority of the breast cancers, if we detect them early, we can address it at very early stage. Dr. Kasha Patel is a cancer specialist who is passionate about preventing cancer and detecting it at the earliest stage possible when it can be cured. He also believes that Medicaid expansion is an important way to save lives and reduce health care expenses. And we can really prevent a significant number of deaths that we are not doing right now. And imagine a young person, maybe 40 year old, who works hard but has no health insurance suddenly gets to know that he's got six more months to live because he had a colon polyp. When you look at detecting cancer at a stage when it's just one polyp, you probably would spend two, three thousand dollars in that patient's care. When you look at the same polyp becoming a full-blown stage for cancer, you're looking at spending about hundred thousand dollars plus. Pastor Johnny McKinney strongly believes that we have a moral obligation to do what we can to help those who are not in the position to help themselves. While he recognizes weaknesses in the Medicaid program, he says there is no reason to ignore the good it does. So while it's not perfect, it is a step, even if a first step, in moving us forward to take care of those who are vulnerable and on the margins of society. Uh, we don't just fund perfect systems. No one would argue that our educational system is perfect. It is a growing and developing institution and process, but I don't see anyone arguing we shouldn't fund public education. Uh, this is a public interest question, not just a political question, uh, and we need to be sensitive to those who are vulnerable and at risk. The good news is that when the South Carolina General Assembly reconvenes in January 2014, our leaders will have another opportunity to expand the Medicaid program. It's important that lawmakers hear from their constituents on this issue. Otherwise, they will assume you agree with the decision they made in 2013. Now, when you die and get to the, get to the, uh, to the meeting with St. Peter, he's probably not going to ask you much about what you did about keeping government small but he's going to ask you what you did for the poor. You better have a good answer.